Well, it's such a, a wonderful gift to have you with us again this morning. Thanks for joining our online worship service. Really a couple things to highlight uh, here at Family of Christ. Remember that next Sunday, Sunday, February 5th, here on site, between both worship services, so around 10 o'clock next Sunday, we're going to have our congregational information meeting. And at that meeting, they're going to update what's our half-year financial uh, finances look like at this point. How's our strategic plan uh, falling into place? We're going to talk about a, a new uh, a recent hire to our staff. And finally, we're going to have a, a chance to talk about our, our capital campaign. And so as we continue to move forward together, just a lot of exciting things happening. Thank you for your generosity, your prayers, and your support. Along with that, uh, this Sunday, it's kind of a cool day, we're going to be commissioning 22 people who are going to be going on a mission trip to Isleta Lutheran Mission in El Paso, Texas, and Juarez, Mexico. So 22 people, keep it up. Uh, whatever we can do to be the hands and feet and voice of Christ locally, or internationally in mission work, that's a huge win for God's kingdom. Let's make our beginning today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, for our confession of sins today, I'm just going to read to you a very familiar confession verse in the Bible. It's from 1 John chapter 1. It says here in verses 8 and 9, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins... God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So as we think about the past week, what have been the relationship struggles that we've had? Maybe it's been words that we wish we wouldn't have said, or maybe it's been opportunities to serve others that we didn't do. Uh, maybe it's just some old grudges, or, or maybe it's a gossip or just stuff that's just weighing on us as a sin. Let's silently confess that to our Lord, knowing that he's going to hear us and be merciful. Well, the Lord hears our confession, and just like we just read, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. As we place our sins and confession at the foot of the cross, Jesus reminds us that he's already paid for those sins in full with his blood, his life, his all. And because he's risen from the dead, it proves that the Heavenly Father found his sacrifice to be sufficient and acceptable. As you trust in Jesus, you are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, today, as we take a look at two sections of God's Word, first of all, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and following. Come, all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen, that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. My faithful love promised to David. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Our gospel reading today is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, and it really ties into today's sermon verse. Again, we're going to be focusing on the Beatitude verse, the fourth Beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled or they will be satisfied. Think of that as we look at today's gospel reading from Matthew 22. God's the host. He invites everyone to his feast. The feast is ready, but many people make up all kinds of excuses because they're not hungering and thirsting for his righteousness. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. 
He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fat and calf have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those who invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and the good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. This is the gospel of our Lord. Well, at this time, let's profess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And again, as we do this, think about that key verse again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So we thank the Holy Spirit for causing us to hunger and thirst for Jesus and then for Jesus giving us his righteousness. Let's profess this together in our creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, let's watch our sermon video. And then again, grab your Bibles. We're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5, right at the beginning, at the Beatitudes of Jesus. Every day we're faced with choices. Every day we have to decide. We have to decide what's going to fill our day, what things we're going to give our attention to. And sometimes the things we choose seem harmless enough and are all right for us at first, but still just a little off, not as satisfying as we thought they'd be. But we're not quite sure. So we try more and more until pretty soon we're consuming ourselves with trying to make this harmless at first choice fill a place that it will never fill, that it was never meant to fill, that it can't fill. And all the while, the answer to our need, to us being fully satisfied, is right in front of us. We just need to choose to take it and drink. If you're a guest with us this morning, over the past three weeks, we've been studying Jesus' Beatitudes, which describe the blissful and blessed life that flows from hearts that are fully aligned with God's. And for this to happen, the Holy Spirit has to radically reconstruct our hearts. So far, we've learned in the first three Beatitudes that blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, and blessed are the meek. In other words, blessed are those who know they're spiritually bankrupt apart from God. Blessed are those who grieve over the mess their sins have created. And blessed are those who completely yield to God's leadership and guidance for their lives. Well, today, as we study the fourth beatitude, there's a shift from the Holy Spirit emptying us to now filling us. So Jesus says... In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Though Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And some translations will say, for they shall be filled. Now, what does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? Well, let's look at Jesus' life for some clarity. If you remember, Jesus' public ministry didn't begin until he was 30 years old. 
The Bible tells us very little about his childhood, but we do know for, for 30 years Jesus did what we all do. He grew up. So Jesus transitioned from infancy to childhood, uh, being a teenager, to adulthood, all in the small town of Nazareth. There Jesus worked as a carpenter, studied God's word, and lived a perfect sinless life. Eventually, when Jesus was baptized by John at the Jordan River, remember this was his inauguration. The Heavenly Father announced, that's my beloved son, listen to him. And the Holy Spirit then, remember, anointed Jesus with power and authority. And Jesus stepped out onto the main stage and began his three-year mission of saving the world. And at that moment, Jesus was undoubtedly brimming, overflowing with anticipation and excitement. But surprisingly, do you remember what Jesus' first act was on his first day on the job. Did he perform a miracle, preach a sermon, or visit someone who was sick? No, he journeyed into the wilderness and he stopped eating for 40 straight days. I mean, I can't even imagine how hungry Jesus was. Now, why did Jesus do this? Well, for two reasons. First of all, Jesus wanted to make sure his human appetites weren't controlling or getting the best of him. Secondly, as Jesus was curbing and confining his cravings, he was also identifying the one thing that fully satisfies a hungry heart from God's perspective. But before I further explain that, here's our problem. Deep down, all of us have these unfulfilled appetites and cravings that we're continually trying to satisfy and gratify. Consequently, who could calculate the time and energy we've wasted chasing after an assortment of things that never fully satisfy, including money, pleasure, possessions, lake homes, lottery tickets, early retirements, strings of relationships, nonstop busyness, sex, power, and popularity. And at times, we sacrifice our families, friends, principles, and values to gain just a few more of these delicacies. And spiritually, this is like taking your children to McDonald's who are miserable until they get a Happy Meal. And you know how it works. The strange thing is, what are the kids most excited about? Not the meal, but the toy, the cheap, pitiful prize. As we get older, unfortunately, our Happy Meals also become way more expensive. It's like Dennis the Menace, right? Looking at a Christmas catalog. And what does Dennis the Menace say? He says, there are a lot of toys I didn't even know I wanted. It's like walking through Home Depot or Menards and continually running into new and improved faucets and flooring, lighting and landscaping, appliances and electronics, tools and tires, paint and patio designs at each and every turn. And suddenly, we must have things we never thought twice about before. In addition, beware of the Super Bowl commercials that we're going to be watching in the next couple of weeks that whisper, your happiness is only a faster car, wider teeth, smoother skin, nicer clothes, and a warmer vacation spot away. But for 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus firmly and resolutely said just the opposite. I'm not going to play this game. Instead, I'm going to hunger and thirst for something far different and far better. And what's that one thing? Righteousness. Really? Hungering and thirsting for righteousness will satisfy us? Yes. Well, to fully grasp what Jesus is talking about, keep in mind there are two kinds of righteousness that the Bible speaks of. First of all, there's horizontal righteousness, which we do as people. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 1, it explains this. It says there, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people 
in order to be seen by them. So Jesus was warning against making a big show out of praying, giving, fasting to gain other people's approval and attention. The second kind of righteousness mentioned in the Bible isn't just horizontal, but the second kind of righteousness is vertical righteousness, which God does and God gives. Jesus perfectly describes this kind of righteousness in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, my confirmation verse, by the way. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God, and notice it's his righteousness. To be righteous before God means he fully approves, accepts, treasures and values you. Sometimes the churchy word for this is justified. So God looks at us just as if I had never sinned. Guess which kind of righteousness, by the way, fully satisfies? You got it. Not horizontal, God's vertical righteousness. You see, unlike our broken culture, which constantly tries to, you know, seek us to pursue our satisfaction and fulfillment and pleasure, performance, and possessions, Jesus says, no, 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 no. Stop eating junk food. You see, the prophet Isaiah emphasizes the same truth in chapter 55, verse 2. He says, why do you spend your money for that which isn't bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? This reminds me of the Nardu plant, which is found in Australia. It, it, it looks like this. It's a water plant. And what the Aborigines used to do is they would pluck the spores off of this plant and they would grind it into dough and into porridge. And although their stomachs were full, this plant and its byproducts there's no protein, no carbohydrates, no vitamins, no nutritional value whatsoever in this plant. So instead of consuming too much of this plant, which becomes lethal, eventually they learn they got to stay away from this plant. Well, in the same way, Jesus knows constantly consuming spiritual junk food not only leaves us unsatisfied and unfulfilled, it also leaves us spiritually dead. So what's the first step? What's the precondition for becoming spiritually satisfied and full? It's recognizing our real hunger. Think of it this way. Remember when you were a youngster and your mom caught you sneaking a cookie or a piece of candy right before dinner and she would say, you can't eat that, it will spoil your appetite. What a peculiar phrase. I mean, isn't that the reason why we were sneaking that snack in the first place to get rid of our hunger? But this is exactly the same point that Jesus is trying to make in this fourth beatitude. That before we regularly consume what's spiritually healthy and good for us, God has to replace our hunger for what's wrong. And a perfect example of this is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. Notice what it says. It says, and he, God, humbled you. He let you hunger. Why? So that you and I would, know, would not live just by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So sometimes God allows us to go through hunger and uh, humbling moments. He allows us to experience problems and crises to pave the way for our hearts to grasp this spiritual truth, that we can't truly live only on physical bread alone. In fact, when the devil tempted Jesus, when remember he was completely famished after not eating for 40 days, when the devil told him to turn stones into bread, he quoted this same verse from Isaiah. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. He says, it is written in Deuteronomy, right? Or in Deuteronomy, excuse me, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's a hunger in our soul that no earthly bread can satisfy. So instead of consuming spiritual junk food, Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. 
Notice he doesn't say, I was the bread of life or I will be the bread of life tomorrow or next week or next month. He says, I am the bread of life right now. And he who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus invites the spiritually starved and the spiritually dead. Jesus invites those who are broken and burned out. Jesus invites you and me to come to him and receive the goods. Jesus himself and his righteousness are the essential, indispensable food for our souls, for our spiritual and eternal life. Now, we can't somehow earn or merit or work for God's righteousness and approval. The only way we receive it is as a gift through faith, right? By believing simply that Jesus is the Savior. Then for the very first time, when we believe, we are now receiving Jesus and his righteousness. And so for the very first time in our lives, we're at peace. We're full of life. We have living hope. And friends, more satisfaction is on the way. When Jesus returns, we will be completely satisfied. The bread of life will come and we will feast. The water of life will come and we will be refreshed. The tree of life will come and we'll be shaded and receive God's bounty. The king of glory is going to come with perfect healing and we will be satisfied freely, absolutely, eternally. That's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. Notice this powerful section of God's word. He says, I consider everything a loss, everything, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I consider them rubbish, scubala, which means garbage, manure, that I may gain Christ. You see, next to the Savior Jesus, all stuff is worth nothing. Really? Yeah, really. Who alone declares us righteous and not guilty? Jesus. Who alone loves and forgives us unconditionally? Jesus. Who alone rose and conquered the grave? Jesus. Who alone is worthy of pursuing all the days of our lives? Jesus. Everything else is scubala, right? Manure, worthless, nothingness. As Jesus himself says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Because when the Holy Spirit leads us to hunger and thirst for Jesus, we will indeed be satisfied. He will fill us with himself. Now for today's prayer, I'm just going to list a couple of, of uh, intercessions, just some opportunities for you to lift up people that are on your heart that you want to pray about today. Heavenly Father, today was a wonderful opportunity for us again to remind it about your righteousness. Thank you for covering us with your righteousness, your approval, with your forgiveness, your holiness. Lord, this morning we pray for this individual who is on our hearts, that we pray that your Holy Spirit would open their ears, their mind, their heart to be receptive to hearing and believing in Jesus. And Lord, there are a lot of people in our lives that we're interacting with on a daily, weekly basis. I lift up this individual before you today who I'm having a struggle with, reconciling, holding an old grudge, where our relationship isn't as strong as it once was or should be today. Hear me now as I lift up this individual to you. Father, you tell us that uh, you are the God of all grace, that you're the healer, you're the great physician. There's a lot of people in our lives, Lord, that we know that are struggling physically, mentally, emotionally. So hear us now as we name these individuals before you and ask for your healing touch in their lives and for support for their caregivers.
Father, you are the one, according to Romans chapter 13, that places all people in positions of authority. So Lord, hear us to now as we pray for our local, our state, our federal leaders, judges, our governors, our presidents. Lord, hear us also as we pray for our firefighters and our policemen and women. Hear us now as we lift up this one or two individuals, especially for you to bless and strengthen. Finally, Lord, there are a lot of people right now that are grieving losses. Maybe it's the death of loved ones. Maybe it's friends moving away. Maybe it's losing jobs or losing something of value from our past. Hear us now as we lift up this family and these individuals who are really grieving at this time. Into your hands, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray. Thank you, Lord, for answering each of our prayers mercifully, and we trust that you'll do what's best according to your will and your timing. Thank you now also for giving us an opportunity to pray together the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the peace, the presence, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and remain with you always. Amen. Let's head out today with these final closing sending words right from God's word. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for the living God. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. Discovering our complete and eternal satisfaction in Christ, let's go in peace and serve the Lord. God's richest blessings on your week. Be sure to watch the list of names. Praise God for each of these individuals, making them part of his heavenly kingdom. Have a great week.